An hour later, I'm, I'm thinking, I wish I would have said that. But Ezekiel responded to that question, can these dry bones live, with a question of his own, or a statement of his own, O oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Isn't that neat? He didn't have to display any lack of faith. <laughs> he didn't have to let God see his doubt, although God would obviously know that anyway. But he just, he answered with this extremely intelligent response that I wouldn't have thought of till much, much later. God, you alone know. You know. And God really does know. I just want to, before we go on in this passage of Scripture, challenge you, friends, that all around us are a lot of dry bones. There's forsaken dreams. There's broken relationships. There's disappointments. There's bondages to sin. We live in a state that statistically, along with the Northwest, is the most unchurched part of the United States. A lot of dry bones. And they were very dry. Even churches can become dead and dry. I didn't feel like that at all this morning. But they can. In fact, Revelations talks about that. Third chapter, first verse to the church in Sardis. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. See, God knows whether we're really alive or whether we're not. And way too often, even in quote-unquote church that's supposed to proclaim, Pastor Andy drew our attention that coming quickly is Easter, we celebrate the resurrected Lord. But friends, if we have a resurrected Lord, then something alive has got to be happening in us. Right. People should not come in without hope and leave without hope. Right. People shouldn't come in in full despair and leave still despairing. They shouldn't come in knowing that they are empty and starving and leave starving. There's something dynamic happens when we meet a risen Lord. But he's acknowledging, and we see in Scripture, that death can really, really happen. And it can happen not just in church or corporate settings. It can happen in our individual lives. Where we talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. You ever had that happen? I, I remember driving to the office one morning early, and I'm driving down... First Avenue North, on one way. And I come up to the stoplight at 14th, and there's a car right in front of me. And on the back of the car was this bumper sticker, Honk if you love Jesus. Now, I didn't think too much about that, except that I thought, I love Jesus. And so I honked. <laughs> and immediately an arm shot out the window, and I got the one-finger salute. <laughs> And I came to the quick conclusion that either that was a Christian having an extremely bad day or somebody bought that car and forgot about the bumper sticker. <laughs> I'd like to believe it was the latter. But when Christ is within us, friends, something happens and we need him. Colossians 2.13 says, you were dead. That's me. That's you. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. Romans 5.12 says that death is passed upon all men because all have sinned. And the question comes this morning, can these bones live where death has happened? You have a friend, you have a loved one, someone who's close to you. You just wonder if their life could ever change. They're so far, far away from God. And we ask the question, can these bones live? Can God do that? We look at perhaps parts of our city and we see it covered with darkness. And we can rightly ask the question, can these dry bones live? Can that be transformed? Can that be changed? 
I think we ought to ask that question. Because there's an answer to that. I have come that you may have life, God says. And he's no respecter of persons. He's no respecter of towns. He's no respecter of churches. He just came so that we could have life. Back to this wonderful portion of scripture in Ezekiel chapter 37. Where did we leave off? The third verse. We'll start with the fourth. Then he said to me, this is God speaking to Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones, I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life and you will know that I am the Lord. Now let's just for a moment put ourselves in Ezekiel's shoes. I am looking at this valley of very dry bones. And God has asked, can these bones live? And I have said to avoid dealing with the reality of doubt and question in my own heart, God, you know. And now he's telling me, speak to these bones. Now, I don't know about you, but if God told me that, and I was looking at this valley of dry bones, I, I would, first of all, look around to see if anybody else could see me. Because I'm smart enough to know that if I start talking to a bunch of dead bones about coming to life, that there's going to be people in white jackets get a hold of me and they're going to put me away so I don't hurt somebody. <laughs> and I don't know if there was a crowd around that day, but Ezekiel had to make a decision. Am I going to obey God? Am I going to do what he has told me to do? This is what I want us to see this morning, friends, is that if you want a miracle, God's going to ask you to participate. He's going to ask you to invest. If we want forgiveness, he's going to ask us to repent. No forgiveness comes without repentance. My participation allows the miracle of God to bring about the total remission of my sins. Removed from me. But I have to do my part. If I really want God to lead and direct me, then I have to take some steps and follow him. Very seldom is the Red Sea parted until we step in it. Very seldom is the miracle displayed until I have actively responded to God's invitation. If I want God's financial blessing and so on in my life, and this isn't the reason we do it, but it's the principle he says, bring you all my, your tithes into the storehouse and prove me herewith, saith the Lord, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven upon you and bless you. But that's not just a one-sided guarantee. It's an asking for participation, for involvement in my part. And sometimes you or I may give out of poverty. We may give out of our own need. But when we obey, God does his part. If we want to see a younger generation experience personally the power of a living God, we have to do more than just simply pray, although that is extremely important. We have to invest ourselves. Maybe it's our resources. Maybe it's a gift that we have. Maybe it's just loving on somebody. What is touching them because we want that miracle. And God says, I want your involvement. Frankly, I, I don't have any way of proving it, but I think that if Ezekiel would not have done what God asked him to do, there would have been no miracle in Ezekiel 37. So now it lies in Ezekiel's hands. God is saying, this is what I want you to do. I want you to speak to these bones. And then in verse 7, so I prophesied as I was commanded. I obeyed. Oh, that is important. And I was prophesying, as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, bones coming together, 
bone to bone. Now again, I like to put myself in Ezekiel's shoes and I'm starting to get excited now. <laughs> I just simply did what God says and all of a sudden these bones are starting to come together. The shaking, this rattling that I see across the valley that I hear. I want to encourage us for a moment. I don't know how much you look at the news. Some days I just avoid it because it can be rather depressing. And uh, yet the reality is, friends, we live in a world where there's a lot of shaking going on. Almost every part of the globe is being shaken to its very core. Economies are turned upside down. Rulers are changed. Borders of nations change almost monthly. Our own country, from my perspective, is in big trouble. Lots of ugly, ugly stuff that is happening that's contrary to the Word of God. But in the middle of all of that, there's a whole lot of shaking going on is God. And He's building His church. He's putting something together that will have life, that has transforming power. And oh, what a wonderful, wonderful story that is that God makes possible. He's building this church. And friends, you can go any part of the world you want to go to today, and he's building his church. It's an amazing thing. It's a miraculous thing. It won't make the news tomorrow morning. And it won't be on the headlines tomorrow night. But the truth of the matter is, in spite of all of the ugliness, all of the darkness, all of the things that seem opposite to the values of Scripture, that God is busy building his church, and it is happening in phenomenal ways. In so many places around the world. Now, verses 8 through 10. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy. Now again, if I'm in Ezekiel's shoes, this one isn't near as hard. <laughs> I mean, I've just seen this miraculous stuff happening. Now I'm looking around hoping somebody's watching. Wow, look at that Alan, man of faith. <laughs> he, he speaks to bones and they come together. Watch what's going to happen now. I hope I wouldn't be that way. But Ezekiel now, I think, is speaking with a different kind of confidence. As he begins to prophesy, and he does, he says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. I want, I want to draw attention. I, I circled that in my Bible, that word slain. See, these just didn't die of old age. They were killed. Life was taken from them wrongly. And that's exactly a picture of death in our world today, friends. God came to give life. It didn't just happen by happenstance. The enemy who came to kill, to steal, to rob, took their life. They were slain. Not of their choosing, but it happened. And he said, so I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. Wow, what a picture. A vast army. 